Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to just study together, to feast upon your word. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, I just pray for all of those who are despondent, who are hurting, that you would take and touch those to he and heal those that are sick, that you would take and open the eyes of those who are blind. We just give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. Filter out all of that which is not of you, but seal to our hearts the truth that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the epistle to the Philippians verse by verse. And in our last study together, we had begun our study of the third chapter. You'll remember that the Holy Spirit longs to fellowship with us, that God has placed us here because it's needful for us to be here. And we have the submission and the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ as a supreme example that we are to be submissive and obedient to the Lord, uh, to His will, as the Holy Spirit ministers in and through us. Going on then in chapter 3, Paul says, after what we've just looked at, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord and I suggested that rejoicing was in the grace we rejoice in the grace of, of our God and in the person and the work of Jesus Christ and I tried to point out that law law keeping uh, the flesh uh, human performance human merit cannot rejoice in the Lord if our focus is on sin, uh, on self, uh, if it's on one another's uh, performance, uh, our own performance, uh, if we are the example that we are to follow, uh, then we really aren't trusting the Lord. But that we rejoice in the Lord in the midst of the affliction and the, and the persecution of a world religious system which demands performance. Be aware of the dogs, uh, the evil workers. Be aware of the concision. And I spent some time talking about that. Beware of the mutilators. Those who would uh, mutilate grace. Now, I would have thought he'd say, well, be, be aware of China. Uh, be aware of Iran. Uh, or be aware of, of saloons or, or bad movies and books. And you could go on and on. Uh, with that the thing that we are counseled to be aware of are the things that look good to the flesh folks human performance and works in the name of Christ these are evil workers it's not that they're idle they're working and uh, but they're working toward the wrong end these are those who are living under law, not, not under grace. And that is a consistent theme throughout all of the, the New Testament. In all of the studies that we've done, through all of the epistles that we've looked at, that thread, that theme, runs throughout the entire uh, teaching of Paul's epistles. In fact, if you really want to be honest, it runs throughout the entire book of, of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. In the Old Testament, we see we have uh, example after example after example uh, as to how the, that walk in the flesh and, and trusting and depending upon self, having confidence in the flesh, does not work. It was not the walk that we were given. So these were people who, by their, their very act, of their acts of human righteousness self-righteousness were mutilating the gospel of grace that's why the play of words occurred there for uh, concision and, and circumcision 
we saw that we are the real circumcision we're the ones we are the ones folks that are cut off for god a circumcision not made with hands and not of the flesh this is a circumcision which is not made with hands and water baptism uh, today is often looked at as the replacement for old testament circumcision and yet the scriptures clearly declare that our circumcision is is one not made with hands uh, I, I suppose you could do that with water baptism but but it would be a it'd be a tad difficult we're looking at a spiritual reality here that is based upon the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are those cut off by God, separated by God, called out by God. And we worship by means of the Spirit of God. We worship God in spirit and in truth. We don't worship God in the sphere of the Spirit. Not in the, we don't worship Him in the sphere of the Spirit. But we worship by the Spirit. And we rejoice in Christ Jesus. And, and we have no trust, no confidence whatsoever in our own performance. In our own goodness, our own self-righteousness. We have no confidence in the flesh. That is not the area of our trust. Our trust is in Christ. And now for the next few verses, we have an illustration of human righteousness. That's what I find so interesting. Uh, it just seems almost inconceivable to me that the Holy Spirit would uh, leave this subject and go on to some other uh, have some other train of thought that everything seems to to follow in progressive order the next few verses that we're going to look at are very interesting verse four though i might i says paul though i might also have confidence in the flesh if any other man thinks that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh i more and so now we see that vivid comparison. So what are the good works of the flesh? Well, most, most everything that I hear and read is based on a moral frame of reference. You know, people who do good, that's, that's people who don't rob banks, they don't cheat on their spouse, and I'm not saying that this might not be the natural outcome of the verses, folks, but it is not the primary reference of the verses which follow. I have, says Paul, if anybody does, I have every reason, more reason. I've got more reason than you to trust in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Now, I see that that, that I more uh, is a first-class condition. It's the condition of reality. Since someone does that, I have a greater opportunity to do that than, than whoever that person is. And we have three aspects over which Paul had no control, none at all. I was circumcised, he says, on the eighth day. Okay, the kid didn't have much to say about that. Circumcised on the eighth day. Dearly beloved, you could not be converted to Judaism when you're eight days old. You had to be at a point of maturity to, to convert to that Judaistic system. And then the sign of that, the sign of that, is, uh, as we see illustrated in, in the Old Testament, which was circumcision. So I start out under the letter of the law, and then I am of the, I am of the true stock of Israel. I can prove that I am of the tribe of Benjamin. I had, that is, I had Hebrew parents on both sides. Both sides. Neither my mother nor my father married outside the tribe.
if if your argument is for human merit, then you have no rational explanation for the stark contrast that Paul is drawing here between the spirit and the flesh. Not only was he of the tribe of Benjamin, but his father, you know, his father was and his mother was also. It was of the purest stock that a man or a woman uh, did not marry outside of their own tribe. They wouldn't marry outside of an Israelite. You know, that would have been terrible. But the pure stock stayed within the tribe so that the family, uh, the possessions stayed within the tribe. So you can't have a better beginning than what Paul had. And he's, that's what he's saying. You, you couldn't have a better beginning than what I had. Precisely according to the law, I was circumcised and both of my parents had stayed within the tribe of, of ben, Benjamin. Now, as touching the law, a Pharisee, and I suppose you could argue that, that, that Paul had some voice. Well, Steve, surely he had some, some choice in that. That he had some voice in whether or not he was going to be a Pharisee. And, 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 and that, to some degree, folks, may be true. But to be consistent with all of Scripture, uh, I would have to say that, uh, uh, though that may have been a human choice on Paul's part, God laid out Paul's walk uh, before him, just as he does with you and just as he does with me. Dearly beloved, I do not know why there is such a strong urgency to put some of this responsibility on Paul. Maybe his parents pushed him into being a Pharisee. I don't know. But as touching the law, Paul was a separatist. Okay, He was absolutely orthodox. He was as conservative and, and orthodox as any Jew could possibly be. The Pharisees were the separatists when it came to, to zeal, okay? Enthusiasm. Verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Not, I never committed fornication, I never committed adultery, I never robbed banks, no. I persecuted the church. Isaac was promised to Abraham long before he was born, just as, as you and I were promised to Christ long before we were born. We're all the children of promise, heirs according to promise. But as then, he which was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. The greatest attribute of the flesh is not acting like a, a despicable human being. Folks, the greatest attribute of the flesh, the single greatest attribute of the flesh, is, is that it opposes God's grace. That is is the outstanding characteristic of fleshly carnality. It's a persecution of grace. You're redeemed by grace, not by works. You're not called to rules and regulations, but to love one another. You're called to the love of God. Well, I, I don't feel like He loves me, you say. Dearly beloved, God loves you. You're, that's what you're called to. You're called to realize just how much God loves you. You're called to realize just how faithful Christ is. The faithfulness of Christ. We don't trust in our own faithfulness, folks. What is, what is the primary reason for my zeal persecuting the church? Not living a high moral life. 
But if you want to see my strict adherence to law, it's persecuting the church. How do I know whether I'm keeping the law? By how much I persecute the church. By how much I persecute Christ. It reminds me of what Christ said to Paul. You know, why, why are you persecuting me? In Galatians, uh, so I'm hoping... If, if we're still here, I'm hoping to move on into Galatians and, and, and do a verse-by-verse -verse study through that epistle, which was is the very epistle to the Galatians was written to address the very problem that we're, we're talking about here that existed right from the beginning of the church. This is nothing new. It's, it was... Uh, uh, written to address the error that had crept into the church right from the very its very inception which was law it 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 basically defined the very conflict that that Paul and Peter had with one another uh, and so in, in in that epistle to the Galatians we learned that if we're trying to live by law we can't live unto God the two that's because the two are in, are in direct mortal conflict if you haven't died to the law and I'm not and let me let me clarify here you have died to the law you have died to sin you've died to the law you've died to that world religious system You've died to self. You, you, in, in, in our being crucified with Christ, we died to six things. I've covered those six things before in previous videos. But if you're trying to live by law, if you haven't died to the law in, in the experiential sense, realize that you're dead to the law, then you can't live unto God. And so the outstanding characteristic you know, Paul says, of my zeal is persecuting the church, the gospel of grace. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Blameless. That word blameless there, it's, it's without charge. No one could bring a charge against Paul. Now, that, that doesn't in, in any way mean that he is, he is righteous, in the sight of God by means of the law but that the law has no charge against him how would the law know whether or not he loved the Lord his God with all his heart and mind and, and strength and soul and body and and his neighbor as himself the law might be able to say that he hadn't murdered somebody but as far as the law is concerned and what the law could do there was no charge laid against Paul now, that's verses 4, 5, and 6. Those were the things of the flesh. The, the claims that Paul could make, and the Holy Spirit had him write these down. But those things which were gains, and that's the word there is plural, okay? It may read gain uh, in, in, uh, in, in whatever translation you're looking at. It's plural. But those things which were gains to me, I think if you have the authorized version, it's singular, but in the Greek, it's plural. Those things which were gains to me, you know, I could add them up. So he could add these all up as gains. The main emphasis here that I want you to see is that these are gains of, of the flesh. And, and the popular activity of the flesh is to persecute the spirit. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. But, but those things which I could add up as gains, those I counted loss for the Christ. It's, it's, uh, it's the Christ. Now, I want to spend just a moment in the Greek because the passage really becomes vivid. When you read it as the Holy Spirit gave it, the word counted in verse 7, 
is a, a word in the perfect tense. And, and so I would translate it, but what, th what things could be added up as gains to me, I have in past time completely counted as loss. And I continually count them as loss for the Christ. That is all that is embodied in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. Yea, doubtless, that's, that's two words, uh, I guess, in, in, in most any, any of the translations. Uh, that's just two words, yea, doubtless, but, but it's actually five words in the Greek. It's, a, it's an amazing expression. Paul wants us to clearly understand that he counted all things but loss. That's a, that, and that is a present tense. I continually count them all as loss. And I, I continue to do so in the present. I've done that in the past. I continue to do that in the present. For the excellency of the knowledge, the, the, the surpassing knowledge, uh, the surpassing excellence, of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Not just Christ, but Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've been made to suffer the loss of all things. And that is a passive voice. I have been made to suffer loss. I hope you, I hope you got that part. That is a passive in the Greek. The, the subject is being acted upon. The subject is not doing the action as it would be if it was an active voice. It is a passive voice. I have been made to suffer loss. And I don't know how many messages that I've heard on this passage of Scripture that have placed all of the responsibility and all of the activity on me. The word is a passive. The subject's being acted upon by an external source. The active voice is you, you do it, you did it, or Paul did it, and it's a passive. Folks, I didn't give up anything for Christ. I think I mentioned this in a, in a past video. If it appears that I did, God phrases it in the passive voice. If, you walk, if, if your walk with the Lord is one of law, then it's self-made righteousness. And if you don't understand that, dearly beloved, then you haven't understood the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I used to, I remember as a kid, you know, I used to, I used to love to play marbles until somebody came along one day and asked me if I wanted to play football, you know, with the older kids. Were, at which time I completely, I immediately left my marbles you know, maybe that didn't maybe that didn't exactly come out sound right, but but you get the point. And and went to play football. So it it would be a foolish boast for me to sit here and preach that I gave up marbles. What I'm really saying is marbles gave gave me up for football. Now, maybe that's a poor illustration, but I continue to count all these things lost, says Paul, for the surpassing excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. The promised Messiah, born in the city of Bethlehem, incarnate in human flesh, who died on the cross and rose again to be my Lord, and implicit in the idiom, is not three names for the Lord Jesus Christ, but all of the person and the work of God, incarnate in human flesh. When you say Lord Jesus Christ, you are, it's that, that title, if, if, you know, if you want to call it that, the, the three names, it encompasses the, the person, in the work of Christ. You know, it seems so odd to me. You know, it's, it's unbelievable that God could over and over again tell me what He's done for me in the Lord Jesus Christ. And because, uh, because of a few verses taken out of context, 
What we predominantly hear preached is a message of warning, not a message of comfort. The surpassing excellence of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ is a message that speaks peace and comfort to the human heart. It's what people need, desperately need to hear today. Because there are people out there, I know there are, who are hurting and despondent. And I'm, I'm speaking in a, in a spiritual, a Christian context. Because they have lived their lives under law. They've tried to please God in the flesh. And that doesn't work. And so they don't have the peace and the joy and the rest that they could have if they understood just what Christ did in their life. That is the number one uh, concern, uh, uh, the number one, uh, I guess you, you could say, I, and I think I've probably said this before, that is my primary concern. That is my, the, the, the primary reason for blessed hope forever is that your life would be, you would realize that in Christ, you, you're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. You have a hope that goes beyond your own human capabilities. And that that hope is secure forever. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I, I read that if I am really proclaiming the word of God, then you are encouraged and comforted. If you're discouraged and burdened, then I'm not teaching truth. I'm teaching law. The great concern in the Christian heart, what should be the, in our greatest concern, the, the great concern that was in the heart of Paul, the great concern that's in the heart of the Holy Spirit, uh, is that we be, become obedient and submissive to the will of God. This is the will of God that you abstain from the fornication. That is having an affair with the law while being a spouse to Christ. That is the will of God. And he's made his will quite clear. You know, and, and, and I also know that the great concern for, you know, on the part of most Christians, those at least who have tried to think through, you know, this and think, uh, try to think through their love of the Savior, is it's all, it always comes around to the possibility of license. You know, I, 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 would, I wouldn't be able to suggest how many times in my life some pastor, some Bible teacher, some Christian on the street has said to me, but, you know, but, but, you know, you're just preaching license. You know, if, if you overemphasize the grace of God, I don't know how you could do that, but if you overemphasize the grace of God, then people are led to live loose lives. You just, you hear that over and over. You know, to me, that'd be saying, you know, uh, that that if a man said to his wife over and over and over again that he loved her, well, you know, that would be leading her into into sin. That's, well, if he really loves me that much, well, I can do anything I want. I mean, you know, folks, surely you wouldn't reach that conclusion. You know that that does not make a lick of sense. A little baby needs to know it's loved. A husband and a wife need to know they're loved. We, as believers, in fellowship with one another, need to know that we're loved. But in a, in a marriage, if, 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 if a husband and wife, if they don't know that they're loved, the marriage won't work. You know, even pets need to know that they're loved. Is it unreasonable for a loving Heavenly Father to pour out His love to you? 
as just as we see that he's done. And if the fact that God loves you, regardless of your condition, independent from your manner of life, if that leads you to license, then folks, you don't understand love. Or worse than that, you have no love for the Savior. The surpassing excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, results in love of the Savior. It results in love of the Savior, not fear of the Savior. Listen to me. How many believers have you met in your life that if they were cornered, pushed into a corner, that they would have to admit that they have a fear of the Savior? That they doubt God's love for them? Dearly beloved, that is why Christ did not say to his disciples, if you fear me, you'll keep my commandments. Keeping his commandments. Folks, that is what the new man does. It's, it's, it's all that it does. He can't do anything else. And it is, it is love that constrains us. God loves us. And it's because of that we have been made to suffer the loss of all things. Made to suffer the loss of all things. It is the consistent testimony of our God. We have been made to suffer the loss of all these things, and we continue to count them but dung, okay? That I may gain Christ. Well, wait, I already thought I had Christ. What, a minute. what do you mean, gain Christ? That I may gain Christ, says uh, Paul, who already knows Christ. Please don't miss seeing that. Okay, Paul's not a non-believer becoming a believer here. That I may gain Christ. And now the message is some, you know, the message is some tear-jerking, heart-cutting story about how Paul needs to come to know the Lord. But we know that that's not what the text is saying. I suppose that the fairest, to be fair with the text of the, of the word dung would be rubbish, Although, in, in, in all fairness to any translator, it could be rendered or it could be translated manure. In, in either event, it's worthless and distasteful. That's how I count those things, which were gains to me, because I've been made to suffer the loss of them through the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. That's the agent. The, the passive verb here requires an operator, and the operator is Christ Jesus the Lord. That I may gain Christ. The word for gain uh, it's an aorist tense. It's, Paul isn't going from being a, a pagan to being a Christian, but a believer transitioning from law to grace. Within, within Paul's life, within that transition that's, that's, that's taking place in his own life between uh, law and grace here. This is, he's growing out of law into grace. He was a former Pharisee, folks. If you don't think that Paul went through some, had many of the same feelings that you do and I do, think again. Paul was no different than us in that sense. When I, when, I, when I fall from grace, I fall to law. We fall from law to grace. Uh, I guess fall wouldn't be the right word. We, we rise from law to grace. We've been raised with Christ. When I give up law, or when I've been made to give up law through the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, it becomes grace. It's done. And there isn't any process of human performance or goal setting. In this verse, there isn't anything the Christian needs to do to gain Christ through the flesh. Okay? We don't gain Christ through the flesh. It's amazing to me, it always has been, folks, how Satan, our arch enemy, has taken and reversed everything. 
everything that you read, he'll he'll reverse it. He'll 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 turn it on its head. It, he'll turn it backwards. Turn it around. Okay. There isn't anything that, that the Christian needs to do to gain Christ through the flesh. Christ is gained by my being made to realize that in Christ the law has been fulfilled. Okay? I did not come to destroy the law, said Christ, but I came to fulfill it. So that all of the law's demands that could be leveled against me were in fact leveled against Christ. Folks, do you know that you have the very embodiment, the very fulfillment of the law living in and through you? That he's he is he's not just and I don't I don't know how to phrase this, folks. Christ is not just some thought in your head. Okay? He's li he's alive, he's God, he's living in you, he's he he fulfilled the law perfectly, he lives his life in and through us, and that by faith. This isn't just poetry. This is reality, folks. Okay? You have the very fulfillment of the law living in you. Okay? For to me, to live is Christ, said Paul. Okay? It is Christ manifest. It's not you. I'm not on my best behavior so that you can see, you know, the best of me. The, point, the whole point is that we see Christ in one another. Did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Verse 8 is not a process in the life of Paul's uh, discipline of his surrender, of his, of, of his obedience, of his walk, but it's the result of the finished work of Christ. Verse 10 speaks of the fact that this is not a process, but a completed action on the part of our Lord. And that directs our attention to our being so closely identified with our Lord. Oh, if Christians today only knew just how closely that they have been identified with Christ. And I'm talking about the baby believer who was born yesterday. Folks, if you've been in the Lord for 50 years, you are no closer to the Lord than the born-again believer, the babe in Christ that was born again yesterday. It's the flesh that makes us, our focus on the flesh, it makes us feel, that, that leads us to believe that that is not true. But it is true. The young believer in Christ is going to spend his entire life growing into realizing just who he is in Christ. That's what we all do. Verse 9, and be found in him, be found in him. That, that happens to be an aorist passive, nothing to do with the work of Paul, the discipline of Paul, the righteousness of Paul, the actions of Paul, the performance of Paul. The passive verb requires an operator. And once again, I suggest reverently to you that the operator is Christ. That I might be found in him not having my own righteousness, which comes out of law. That's in the experiential sense, okay? Not the positional sense. Paul is righteous, righteous in Christ. But that I might be found in him not having my own righteousness in the experiential sense which comes out of law, but that through the faithfulness of Christ. The faithfulness of Christ, it's a genitive that is the of God righteousness. It's upon the basis of faith. It is faith's righteousness, says the Greek. Not my faith in Christ. It's not your faith in Christ. It's not my faith in Christ. It is Christ's faithfulness. The genitive tells you that is Christ's faithfulness, not Paul's. 
if if Paul couldn't stack all that pertaining to the law up next to the finished work of Christ, then if how could someone like you or I, folks, To add anything of human performance to what Christ did is nothing short of mutilation. And Christianity today is not only added, they have supplanted, they have replaced in their minds, they've exchanged his righteousness for their own righteousness, and it ought to be the other way around. This text says, how can I look at my performance or my work? When I look at the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, what righteousness could I ever have by law keeping? The law was not made for a righteous man. And that is what we are, all of us, you and I, all of us are. That's what we are, positionally speaking. Okay? We are righteous in Christ. We're made the righteousness of God in Christ. And you had nothing to do with that. But in our experience, in realizing that, as, as, that reality, as the reality of that is worked out in our daily lives, maybe we will, maybe we will not. Okay? You have, we have a subjunctive mood here that I have to deal with. There's no getting around it. It's maybe you will, maybe you won't. That's not maybe you will, maybe you won't be made the righteousness of God in Christ. The, the, the subjunctive mood here, look, that I may win Christ, okay? The Greek word is that I may gain Christ. Paul already had Christ. He already knew Christ. The word win or gain, that, that word gain is an ancient uh, trading term, um, commerce, exchanging, you know, uh, mercantile term. Uh, it's exchanging, trading one one good for another. It meaning to exchange or trade out what is what is mediocre uh, for the better. You know, you're trading up, okay, as as you'd say. But subjunctive mood of uncertainty. You know, in James uh, chapter four, you're familiar. Maybe you're familiar with the verse. Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow. Uh, we'll go into such a city and we'll continue there a year and we'll buy and sell and get gain. That, that is make a profit. That's, that's the word. That's the word. Same word. There is no profit whatsoever in law keeping as a rule of life. God declared that the law was for, for childhood. Not, and not your childhood, but Israel's childhood. And when Christ came, the law was fulfilled. You have never been under law. I have never been under law. The church has never been under law. Never has been. You wouldn't know that looking around today. But that is a fact. It was never given to the church. The law was never given to the church to begin with. It was given to Israel. You've never been under law. I'm going to be found in Christ, passive voice, not found because of the way I live. That's the law. You know, it seems inconceivable to me that this ninth verse is used to preach human performance. I'm going to live in such a way, that is grace, that I'm going to be found in Him, the righteousness of Christ. Being found in the righteousness of Christ has nothing to do with how you live has nothing to do with how Paul lived, that is, by law. And that is that is a difficult concept for Christians today to grasp, folks. But that is the Christian walk. I praise God that I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ, a, a righteousness which cannot be um, marred. I'm a new creation in Christ in which His seed eternally dwells in me as a new creation in Christ, and that new creation cannot sin. You know, the old man, it sins. That's all it does. 
but as a new creation in Christ, I'm clothed with the righteousness of Christ. That's the message of grace. If in any way you are being clothed by your own righteousness, you're not under grace, but under law. The righteousness that's going to be found in me, says Paul, is the righteousness of Christ. Found. Found. That's the same word for uh, you'll, you'll see for Mary being found with child. I don't want to be found clothed in my righteousness. The only righteousness that, that could... Uh, it's, I want to be found, passive voice, not having my own righteousness, which, which is out of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. My Bible says the faith of Christ. Now, translators, they obviously wanted you to see it as, as objective. Your faith in Christ, it is an unarticulated gen genitive the genitive shows possession. If you were to translate it fairly and consistently, you would translate it by means of Christ's faith. I believe that's what the text says. That I may be found passive, no action of my own, but an, an action which I received by an outside operator, that is Christ, because of His faithfulness. If I tell you that this righteousness of God is based upon my faith in Christ, I'm saying what the majority says. But I, I cannot and I will not say that, folks. If, I, if I'm the last person on the planet, I can't say that. I cannot say what's go against what's written. There's no, and there's no comfort in that. There's no grace in that. There's no love in that. There's only fear. And yet, apparently, that is where modern thought has gone. If I make that my personal faith in Christ, then I have destroyed, I have mutilated the entire message of these verses. Romans 3.21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Next video, I'm going to spend some time looking at these... Uh, verses 10 and 11, uh, that I may know Him, that's experientially know, the word there in the Greek is, is not perfect knowledge, oida, it's gnosko, it's experiential knowledge, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain unto the out-resurrection of the dead, that's the word is out-resurrection. There's only one occurrence of that word in all the Bible, and it's found right here. It's, it's not, it is not one of the 42 occurrences of the word resurrection, uh, the word resurrection being anastasis, but it, it is ex-anastasis, okay? It is out-resurrection from the dead, and this is an amazing, amazing passage. We'll look at it next time, Lord willing. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Thank you so much for everything. Rest in Him. And until next time, thanks for watching.